Hello and welcome to this TBI Fireside Chat. My name is Richard Middleton, editor of TBI, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Sherry Brennan, TV industry veteran uh, and EVP and general manager of WIP Media Exchange. Hi, Sherry, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Lovely to have you with us. We're very fortunate to, to have you for, I think we've got about 20 minutes or so, so we've got lots and lots of stuff to get through. Uh, lots of things to learn about what WIP Media is doing with its exchange, and it's got some really interesting uh, new uh, developments on the card. So looking forward to, to discussing all of that. Um, first of all, let's talk about yourself a little bit. Um, obviously, we know you formerly at Cablevision and Fox. Um, now you're at WIP Media. Tell us a little bit about what WIP Media does and, and what you do there. Sure. So it's really quite an interesting role for me because I started uh, with big data modeling a thousand years ago, and then I moved into the cable operator side and worked for a couple of cable operators, including Cablevision, uh, and then went over to Fox for 15 years and did a lot of licensing. So it, this job really brings all those pieces together because what WIP has built in the exchange is an online platform that lets buyers and sellers of content find each other and conduct uh, transactions to license content. Uh, we enrich content listings with proprietary uh, modeled demand scores and insights, which we can talk about later. Um, and we let people learn about how their content is likely to do or what content they should buy and, uh, and make transactions through our platform. Uh, so I've been brought on board to be the general manager of this new service. Uh, we're in beta right now, and we'll be launching commercially in the fall and winter this uh, in the next few months. Great stuff. And the, yeah, the exchange it seems, it seems like a really interesting uh, sort of move uh, for WIP Media. So it's to do with obviously rights management, but it's a bit more than that. You've got sort of data insights as well and predictive uh, AI services that uh, are able to tell uh, potential customers what's coming up. Let's talk about the sort of yeah, the exchange and the rights side of it, the rights management bit. We, obviously, there are other companies that are doing similar sort of online distribution services. What sets WIP Media Exchange apart from, from what those guys are doing? I think there are a few things. First of all, uh, the company has been around for quite a while. It is the aggregation of three different companies that have been purposefully built or purchased and put together into the WIP Media Group. Uh, the TV Time app and platform for consumers to figure out what they'd like to watch and keep track of it and talk about it. Uh, that's one piece. The TVDB, which is a crowdsourced metadata platform. And then last but not least, MediaMorph, which has been integral to the digital content distribution ecosystem for years and doing all kinds of backend processing. And as a result of these three companies coming together, we have huge uh, architecture and infrastructure behind this exchange, uh, which I think is unlike any other. Uh, it is a very powerful set of tools that already exist, already do all kinds of things for big clients, every major Hollywood studio, for example, and dozens of other clients from digital platforms to airlines to networks. Um, so lots of clients who are already using our architecture and our underlying systems to help manage different elements of the supply chain and workflow of the digital distribution ecosystem. Um, the reason this is important is because it gives us a really powerful tool set to bring to bear into the content licensing sphere. Um, mm -hmm. So while this is sort of one piece of the digital content uh, distribution system, obviously licensing is hugely important. Um, and what we are able to do because we have the access to all this data from uh, consumer preferences data that we harvest from the TV time platform to the real world outcomes data that we're able to aggregate and harvest from the media morph side of things. We're able to bring those two together uh, in a really interesting and powerful predictive model. And that lets us understand how pretty much any piece of content will perform or is likely to perform uh, in any territory around the world and on any platform. So we can tell that whether the piece of content has been uh, in the marketplace before or not, because we know a lot about what kinds of content different people around the world like to watch. Um, this TV time platforms all around the world. We only have less than 10% of our users in the US. We have 18 million users in all. So it's a huge set of data that we're able to harvest uh, for this purpose. So it's pretty remarkable, really. And one of the reasons I was very excited to come to WIP 
uh, back mm-hmm. in January when I came on board is because I've not seen any other set of data that is this broad and that really captures the entire marketplace around the world in the way that this data set does. And I mean, in terms of sort of the, the rights owners and uh, that side of the business, you know, if I'm a, I, I own a show and I come to, to you guys and we put it on this the, onto the the service, what happens from from, from yeah from from there on, as it were? How does the process sort of uh, progress? Sure. Um, and I, sorry, I realized I didn't fully answer your prior question, so I'll I'll embed that in this in this answer. Um, so. A content rights owner would list their titles and their rights information within the exchange, um, and we help them onboard it all. And I should say we're building some tools to make it easier for them to sort of self-ingest their rights. We then enrich that rights data with our proprietary demand score, which is a predictive index. It tells people how a given title is expected to perform on a given platform in a given territory and a given availability window. Uh, So it's a number between one and 200 with 100 as an index generally does indicating average expected performance. And we enrich, so we enrich that, that listings data with demand scores and with other predicted uh, indexes like a, uh, a measure of demo appeal, for example a measure of fan engagement in the show and some other insights. Uh, Then the sellers of the content rights use all of that information. Uh, We have an auto avail process that we uh, let them use to create the universe of possible buyers for their content. So on the buyer side, we're collecting where does the buyer want to buy content And what business model do they want to buy it for? Is it only AVOD or are they buying for lots of different models, linear, et cetera? We collect all that for the buyers and we sort of marry that with what the sellers have rights for. And that creates a set of possible avails for buyers. The sellers then review all of that and decide on a buyer by buyer basis, if they wish, which avails they'd like to make visible to buyers. So then a buyer can come into the system. They see a shopping screen that looks very much like a UI. You might see if you're going to, as a consumer, go to like pick what to watch on Netflix or something like that. So they'll see a very user-friendly, very sort of sales-oriented shopping experience. And they know that every single title that's listed there is available to them for their business model in at least one of the territories where they operate. So they're not sifting through a bunch of listings and getting excited like, oh, I see this title and I, I, can, I can license it. And then they realize, oh, shoot, mm. not available in my territory. No, if you're a buyer on the exchange, everything you see is available to you. Um, and then you can, as a buyer, make a request back to the seller. Um, and we see different ways that sellers are wishing to interact. Some sellers want to put their pricing right up front and then the buyers can react to it. Others want the buyer to make the first move and the buyer to make an offer. So we enable both uh, scenarios. And then there's just this licensing workflow that goes back and forth. It kind of, if you think about it, uh, replicates what often happens in today's marketplace where people send each other spreadsheets back and forth and contracts back and forth through email, uh, mm. sometimes you know with a phone call in between or whatever. Um, but in this case, everything is housed within the platform. So things don't get lost. You don't forget anybody because all of your licensing activity is really housed in this really efficient place. So not mm. only do we have these really great insights that we can, uh, that you know, are certainly proprietary to us and really powerful to help people make the right decisions, both for their catalogs and for their platforms. Um, but we also have these sort of workflow efficiency tools that make it very streamlined for people to keep track of this work. Um, And I also think it makes it a lot easier for new partners to find each other. So Mm -hmm. I like to give the example of like, you know, maybe Lionsgate and Netflix, they don't really need help finding each other, right? That's easy. (laughs) But what they both need help with is finding those smaller partners. So the smaller partners also need help because they're out there like waving, hey, notice me, notice me. And of course, it's very hard to get the attention of some of the bigger players. 
Um, mm. So in this way, we think we'll be able to enable a much richer marketplace uh, for both buyers and sellers. And, and as you said, I mean, it's, it's very much an international global service. Um, it's not just focused on the US. So you've got customer, I mean, is, you know, you've got clients on, on both sides in, around the world. We do. And we actually have, uh, have people around the world as well. So that's actually super helpful. We have offices in London, New York, and LA. I'm based in LA, um, but I have team members in both New York and London. So we're able to work in the relevant time zones for customers around the world. Um, if we uh, get more business going in Australia, we'll probably open an office there as well, because that that time zone could be challenging for us. Um, but yes, we are global already and have clients around the world in, in dozens of countries. And um, we think the exchange will really, um, you know, in success, we should have clients in every country around the world because certainly content is going everywhere around the world. Sure. And you touched on it before, but the demand score seems like a really interesting concept um, in terms of sort of a predictive tool, as it were. I mean, what sort of are you, are you gaining any insights in terms of, you know, perhaps trends or data that's coming out, you know, suggesting what sorts of shows are likely to do well in certain countries? Do, do some countries have preference for, for reality more than drama or things like that? Are you able to tell that type of uh, that type of trend? We are. Yes, we have um, many years experience of working with our underlying data. And we do have many clients today who use our data to make either purchasing decisions or in some cases, green lighting decisions. So there's already quite a history of usage of our data uh, in, this, in this sphere. With the exchange tools, we're able to help clients understand how their content is likely to perform. Um, and of course, that's all kind of a seller cares about, right? Is where should I license my content to maximize the return on the investment? And we're able to see things like um, Latin American or, or origin telenovelas, for example, do very, very well in certain territories, for example, in Europe. So we're able to see things like that. Like if you had a set of telenovelas from Argentina, you might not realize that they would do very, very well in this particular country in Europe. We will help surface that to people and, and have done and can do. Interesting stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've worked cable and pay TV and now you're in online distribution. Uh, we've seen, I mean, the business has transformed over the last three or four years, never mind the last 20. Um, how do you sort of see the next couple of years, you know, with, uh, with with media and the exchange and that way of buying, how do you sort of see that fitting into the wider ecosystem of, of distribution? Well, I think from the sort of whip centric perspective, you know, our mission is really to to be embedded in the fabric of digital online content distribution or, or just digital distribution, really. But in terms of the future beyond that, you know, we really see a lot of opportunity here as the demand for content continues to grow and people around the world are expanding in terms of the kinds of platforms that they're interested in in launching in different uh, markets around the world. And of course, the business models uh, by which content sellers want to license content, that just continues to explode and evolve as well. So I don't have a crystal ball to tell you what the next business model is, but I do have the next best thing, which is 18 million people around the world telling me what they want to watch and what they are watching. And dozens and dozens of clients telling us, hey, you need to build your system to accommodate this new model. Um, so mm. I think our sort of bird's eye view of the industry is really going to help um, us stay current. And then I think, of course, the industry is going through tremendous consolidation and change right now as well. Um, and we're seeing that. You're seeing, you know, Amazon buying MGM, for example. That really doesn't change the need for whoever owns MGM to keep track of how they're licensing MGM's library, right? Mm. Um, so there's still the same sort of need to manage all this exploding demand for content. And I think we will have uh, many fingers in, in those pies as we go along. It sounds like it. And you guys, I mean, you mentioned you're in beta mode at the moment with the exchange. Um, yeah. Just briefly, I know we're running out of time quickly, but in terms of sort of the way that, yeah, you're going to go from beta and then launch, um, how much does it cost? Is there anything you can sort of talk to us about on that side of, of you know, for partners, for on the buyer side and I guess the seller side as well? How is it sure. all going to look once you, once you launch for real? Right. So like I said, we're going to be pricing this on a dollars per month per user basis. 
Um, mm -hmm. We will be providing tools that uh, have a lot of value um, in addition to the listing service of the exchange itself. The analytical tools that we've built and are continuing to evolve will let uh, buyers and sellers compare either their, their catalog or their existing content to hundreds of thousands of titles on platforms around the world. Um, so we think there's value in those analytical tools. Um, that said, we don't want to price this such that only the big players can afford it. So we've landed on a pricing model that we haven't released publicly yet, but I'll just say uh, we believe it would be affordable to even the smallest players. Maybe someone who has only one title or 10 titles they might find it more advantageous to license through a third party aggregator. Um, mm -hmm. But anybody with any sort of library bigger than that, I think um, as a seller would find it, it quite feasible. And any buyer who's buying content, um, you know, this tool will be quite affordable to them as well. Um, it's literally a few hundred dollars per uh, month per seat. So it's not uh, we're not talking hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, unless, of mm -hmm. course, you know, you have tens of thousands of people using it, which, which we might. So we'll see, we'll see who comes along and wants to uh, sort of do the, the uh, you know, unlimited seats model. But um, I think for, for most, most of the players in the industry will be quite affordable and, and really isn't intended to be priced, uh, to have price as a barrier at all. Sure. And then, yeah, I mean, we're, we're out of time now, but just a, one last question in terms of sort of what's up next for Rip Media? Obviously, you guys got the exchange to, to its law. When, when's beta mode ending and when's the real thing uh, going to be rolled out? So the beta product is a, the real functional product. It's just continuing to evolve and add tools. And uh, we think the tool set, we have one big thing coming in the fall. But other than that, most of the tool sets there. Um, and then we'll be beginning to launch commercially uh, towards the end of the fourth quarter. And of course, into 2022, we'll be in commercial mode fully. Um, and you'll see us at conferences around the world starting in September. Uh, we'll be at all the usual places and um, hosting what we call a licensing lounge, where people will be able to come and have a drink or a snack and get their hands on the system and see what it looks like. Great stuff. Well, looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Ray. Fascinating uh, venture. Really interested to see how it all yeah, progresses. It sounds like there's yeah, huge insights that you guys are, are making available to the industry already and lots of uh, interesting concepts and ideas coming out of it all. Um, well, I so look, look forward to showing to you in person sometime soon. Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, definitely looking forward to uh, actually meeting face to face and uh, yeah, getting my hands on it so we can see some of those uh, those insights and those predictors as well. See what the next big thing is going to be. Um, but for now, we have to wrap it up. Um, Shelby Brennan, thank you very much. Fascinating to talk to you and uh, look forward to hearing more soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.